So let me do a quick introduction of myself. I'm Kristen Leslie. I'm the uh, on the faculty. I teach pastoral theology and care. I've been here a bunch of years, and as well as teach pastoral care, I also am the co-director of the Eden Gleaning and Garden Project, uh, which is what brings me here today with you. So I'm going to go ahead and share my. So we're going to be talking today about the community gardening uh, ministry in the soil. So as I said, I have worked with the I'm the co the co-director of the Eden Gleaning and Garden Project. And for the last six years, uh, Karen Petmeyer, Reverend Karen Petmeyer, has co-directed this program. It started six years ago um, when uh, we were beginning to, uh, it, it was before COVID, but not much before COVID, um, where we put both the garden and, and kind of a larger gleaning project, which I'll just say a little bit about before we move too far on. Uh, but before we do that, I'm mindful that uh, Heber Brown, who's executive director of the Black Church Food Security Board, kind of says it so well around thinking about the role of faith communities and community gardens, which is whatever land that God gave you and whatever land your church sits on, you can use it to the glory of God, your church, and your community. Ministry can mean what you do in the soil just as much as what you do in the sanctuary. I'm really clear that how we um, caring for each other and caring has direct connections for how we care for the world. And, and clearly you've been asleep if you've not heard all the conversations about climate crisis and things like that. Um, and I think working in a garden makes us much more careful of how we live in the world. Um, and so I, I, I am committed to working in gardening not just because it feeds people, but because it's a way to care for the world. So here's what I think we're going to do today. We're going to talk about community, community gardening as a faithful response to community needs. We're going to do a little bit about what to consider. We're, this is going to be a very practical conversation. What do you need to consider? Where to start? And some resources. I'm mindful that I'm, that I'm sure that there are people in the room, maybe you yourselves are gardeners or have done community gardening. Um, so I just bring one um, perspective in all this, and I would really love to hear more from you as well um, as we go along. So if you want to go ahead and put things into the chat, um, if you would watch those, perfect, thank you. So the Eden Gleaning and Garden Project uh, has two components. One is the Eden, the Garden of Eden, we like to call it, which provides fresh produce for faith-based food pantries here in St. Louis responding to hunger and food, food insecurities. We educate our community about urban gardening techniques, and then we partner with area food communities serving the region. So you see very much we're committed to both for, uh, growing food, providing food for folks, connecting to communities. And then the, uh, the gleaning and the garden, excuse me, the gleaning aspect of it itself is where we actually work with uh, Indiana farmers, where we go into their field after they have harvested it and we glean uh, produce. Last past year, we gleaned about 18,000 pounds of produce. Um, so we engage volunteers who glean unharvested produce, and then we connect with farmers and churches and communities working to respond to food hunger and food scarcity. And then we also te teach about food waste and food apartheid and transformative work and how communities gather. One of the things that we are very committed with the Eden program is that we recognize um, that uh, the mission that we have uh, is really central to how we determine what we're going to do. And I should say that at Eden Seminary, this is not the first time graduates or uh, folks at Eden have thought about gardening. In the 1850s in Marthasville, uh, Eden students and faculty uh, gardened. They worked in the farm. That's how they uh, both raised money for themselves but supported themselves in that in their community and in their work. So we're just stepping into a nice long line of folks who are doing it. So this is the Eden Garden, or part of it anyway. And this is a, so we see absolutely gardening is a faith-filled response to what's going on in the world. Um, we see it, the work both is thinking about who's in our community and what they need, what the resources we have, and how we partner with each other. One of the things that we have been mindful of is that um, we want to know what members of our community need. 
because one of our mission statements, we'll get to that in a little bit, is serving the needs of communities, not just growing things because it's fun, which is okay to do that, but that's actually not our mission. So the first year we planted, which was six years ago, we just planted things that interested us and we thought we could grow. Um, and the second year and after that, we, um, uh, we were much more clear of the partners that we were gonna be supplying food for and asking them what they wanted. Um, so the gardening that we do, we uh, have, uh, we're both serious and we're, we can be very playful about it. So this is actually a sign that as you come up to our garden, you will see the garden of Eden. Go ahead and eat the fruit. What could possibly go wrong? Um, there's a playful element to the work that we do. So let me talk a little bit about how that sets into the larger uh, ecosystem of what's going on with food. So in 2022, we, uh, the USDA showed us that 34 million people experience food insecurity. Not um, They had access to food that was not good for them but not a lot that was good for them. So of that 34 million, a third of them, 11 million of those were children. 56% of food insecure households reported participating in the, in the SNAP and WIC programs, the federal nutrition programs. And that becomes important because how people gain access to food is so based on regulations. And that's a scary thing. In uh, February 2022, Congress stopped the COVID era supplemental SNAP program uh, payments for folks, which meant there was this hunger clip that hit all ages, including many older adults who only qualified for minimum SNAP benefits. So going from $280 a month to $30 a month, um, which you absolutely can see the problem. Here in the Missouri and Illinois bi-state region that had direct implications, so one out of nine people in the bi-state region experienced in food insecurity. And across, you can see the numbers across Missouri, that's nearly 700,000 people. And out of that, 200,000 are children. So it creates and forces some choices that people have to make. 40% of them had to choose between paying for food and medical care. 53% had to choose between feeding their families and paying utility bills. 42% had to choose between paying for food and paying for housing. And 39% had to choose between fueling their cars to get to work or family food. Those are choices that no one should have to make. And yet with our economy, that is absolutely what has happened, which suggests having food, uh, participating in food production and growth becomes one way for us to engage that and healthy food production becomes really important. So the other thing that we know is that in, in areas where there are no grocery stores or no healthy grocery stores, uh, uh, race, uh, uh, there's a racial element to this um, that is pretty significant. And so what we know that black residents in St. Louis are more than twice as likely as white residents to have limited access to healthy food. And uh, scholars and researchers are calling, rather than calling that, well, they're calling, they're using the term food apartheid because what it really does is it links the, the systems of access to food toward not just one particular issue, but it's a systemic thing that it has to do with race and class and gender and socioeconomic status. But we know that um, particular, we know that race is absolutely uh, involved with higher levels of access to good food. The Reverend Heberbrandt, who's in charge of the Black Church Food Security Network is uh, doing really important work on the role that Black churches uh, play in all of this. And at the end of this PowerPoint, and we will make this available to you there, I'm giving you a, a link to the Black Church Food Security Network and the work that the Reverend Heber Brown is doing in communities. He came on our campus last year and spoke. Uh, he provides some really important resources um, and would uh, highly recommend taking a look at the work that he does. So, there are a couple different uh, community garden models that I want us to think about. Um, and I'm gonna suggest some, and then I'm gonna ask you what you would add to this list. 
So the first one is just kind of a church garden on your church property. Many churches have property that where you could plant a garden, which is great. Another model is having a church garden on community property, where there might be open plots um, in the community itself, where you could partner with the, with the community. If your church doesn't have uh, land to grow on, but there are other folks who do, um, to have a partnership and to work on to plant things on a community property. A third model is what I'm calling a plant a row community garden, which is um, one example of it is to find churches, uh, people in your church who already have gardens in their backyard and work as a group to have them plant one row for the garden, for the distribution that you might do with your church. So if, you, if you're in a community where many people already have uh, gardens in their backyard, particularly if you're in a rural community where lots of people already have gardens, this might be a great way to bring folks together and together you agree who's going to plant what. And you think everybody just does one row or two rows of something. And it goes um, back then to your community effort. That's a lovely way to have folks, uh, if they want to participate, but they already are doing gardening in their backyard. This is a, a lovely way to have everybody join together. And then another way to do it would be partnering with other churches. That is, um, have a, uh, several churches come together and you all agree that each church is just going to plant one or two crops at a larger volume than you might do that you would plant in your own garden. So those are some uh, four different models. I'm wondering um, if there are some models that you that you have thought about that are not on the screen. A garden that's more urban, I guess, based, especially churches that are like landlocked or don't have a lot of actual plot. I see you have a lot of containers at yours. So that kind of tiered. That's nice, Christopher. Thank you. Yeah. And in fact, what you can see in that picture, and I'll talk a little bit about this later, but we have some the white buckets and the yellow buckets that you can see there. We got all of those for free. Any grocery store that has a bakery in it that ices their, uh, those are all buckets that have icing in them, frosting. Any grocery store like Schnucks, like Whole Foods, um, where they put icing on in the store, they get these buckets and they just have to throw them away, them away or recycle them at the end of the day. Hmm. You can go to a grocery store and ask if they've got buckets, particularly Schnucks will do them to you. Are there other models? How about partnering with schools? Nice. Yeah. Do you want to say more about that, Diane? Um, I'm recently here from California. And a lot of the school districts uh, were the source of a community garden. Mm -hmm. And the students really kept it going uh, during the bulk of the year. But then the community took it over during the months that the schools were off session. That is a brilliant model. Yes. That's perfect. And particularly if you've got some folks who are living in a senior facility who may not be able to they don't have the property and they themselves might not have the energy to do all the, the, that kind of early grunt work and putting things in to partner with the school. I think it's a brilliant model. So I'm going to just get down to the basic tasks of this, starting a community garden project. Here are a couple of things we're going to, I'm going to cover all these things, but I've just put it in a list for you here. So let's start with I think it's always important to start with clarifying your mission or purpose. Why do you want to do this? Do you want to feed your church so it's kind of internal? Or do you want to feed your community because you know that there's a need? Or do you want to teach others how to grow things so it's a demonstration garden? Do you want to teach gardening techniques? And I want to be clear, you don't just have to pick one of these, but I think it's important to know why you want to do this. Uh, are you, is part of the role of your community garden to provide space for the community to gather? Um, are you providing space for church members or community members to grow their own garden? So sometimes it's the church is doing the community garden and all they're doing is providing the space. 
and allowing other people to come and have ownership of their own little tracks, their little spaces to do. That's a, that's an, another model. Um, is it evangelism? Or is the church interested in evangelism by inviting folks to join your faith community? That is a model as well. Uh, whatever your mission is with your garden will determine a number of the next steps, which I think is why it's important to name it up front. Why you want to do a community garden? What would you add to this list? Let me make sure you can see those things. I can't see. Why what, what would you add to this list? Kind of purposes for having a community garden. At one of the little gardens I help out with, it's to really bring the elder community in. Mm -hmm. Now we had to make a lot of special um, high rise uh, plants for them or planters for them, which entailed a tremendous amount of dirt and, and shoveling. But I'm impressed by how much they grew in such a small place. Nice, nice. Thank you, Kendall. Other ideas? I've just found the, the cost of fresh um, herbs and spices are, it, it's just prohibitive, but I'm not having very good success growing them myself. And I, I know people would like to have more education about that. Yeah, yeah. Thank you, Diane. So I'll move on here. So after you have a sense of clarifying you why you want the community garden, um, so uh, here is, this is the Eden Glean Garden Project. We clarified our mission early on. So it's to, to work to end hunger, to reduce food waste, and to connect communities. That became really important to us because the connecting communities thing took a, a really important role. And because of that, then, we realized our number one goal was not to produce the most amount of food we could grow because we knew that there were a lot of different models that would do that much better than we could ever do that. And if that was really our mission was just to produce, to, to get access to the most amount of food, there are, there are other kind of different models to work on than this. So really, because these were our, our three things, and, and I should say we're talking both about gleaning and gardening, which is why the food, the reducing food waste is in there, but connecting communities became really central to the work that we did. Once we identified those as, as kind of the, the things that were propelling us into the work, it helped us answer later questions about who participated and how often and the interactions we had. So we regularly come back to our mission statement so that we, um, so that as we other questions come up for us, we have, it's easier to clarify. So organizing the work. Organizational approval and support. If you're going to be working in a church, um, uh, are you going to have support from the larger uh, vestry or judicatory? Um, is this just something you individually as a church member are doing? Do, if you want buy-in from the larger organization, it's going to be important to get a sense for what's the organizational approval and support that you're having. Um, so if you're a church that's going to be working in the community, uh, who's, the, who's the organization overlooking the communal space that you're going to be in? You're going to need to kind of give some consideration to that. Is this a community? Uh, who is coming together, or is this one person, one, one visionary in a community who wants to kind of chart the course? That way you move forward is going to be quite different if it's all on one person's idea or if it's a committee who's working together. That becomes important to think about those two things. What's the role of the church staff? Are you expecting that the church staff is going to play any role in it? Communicating, um, putting newsletters out, any of that. You want to be clear about it from the start and make sure you have buy-in from the church if that's what your expectation is. Just to be name up front, what's happening? What's the role of non-church members? If you're really thinking about this as a church per, um, effort, what's the role of non-church members? Are they participating in this way, same way? Are you having the same expectations of them? You want to create a budget for the garden. We're going to talk a little bit later about some things that might go on that budget. Um, 
Are you expecting that people just are going to donate seats? Are you going to buy them? Where will you get them? Things like that. So funding sources. The church, is this going to be a budget line item? Or is this going to be a special offering? Or are you just going to be asking people uh, periodically to kick in? Will you have community support? Some there in some of our communities, uh, they will make uh, access to some kinds of funds for community gardens. I'll talk a little bit about that on another slide. And then grants. There's all sorts of grants, denominational grants. The UCC has the Neighbor in Need grant. Uh, the Eden Garden set, we've gotten the Episcopal grants, we've gotten UCC grants, we've gotten United Methodist grants, we've got Lutheran grants. So there are all these, there's different church bodies that have grants that are small enough. And uh, if you're going to go for a grant, it would be helpful to work with someone within your, your church to talk about how that's going, because it will need to be institutional based, not just by an individual. But grants are a good source of that. And you're going to want to go for smaller grants, not larger grants, because smaller grants have much less oversight. And you don't have to write them, spend all your time writing reports. You can actually do the work. Okay. Who will receive your produce? Uh, this is um, the Karen, Reverend Karen Pettmeyer in the blue, who's the... the other director of this program with me. And this is one of the food ministries where we take food. The food that you see there was from our Bellini project. But who will receive the food, the, the, the produce that you're doing? This is a really important one and needs to be discussed, uh, considered early on. Are you, take, are you growing food for the current ministries in your church? Or are they for other ministries or both? That becomes really important to consider because you want to ask uh, whoever's going to be receiving your food, you want to ask them what they want. What do they want you to grow if you're going to be growing it there or regardless of where you're doing it? How often do they want to get food from you? And how will you get it to them? Those are two really, three really important questions to ask as you're thinking about uh, this. Um, our first year in the Eden Gleaning Garden Project, we just planted what we wanted to plant. The second year, we began to ask the food ministries that we had established, what kind of food, what kind of produce do they want? Because we discovered some of the things that were really easy for us to grow were not the things that their communities knew how to produce, uh, process and eat. So we had to quickly make adjustments from, uh, we were early on growing lots of kale, um, and lots of lettuce, and we shifted that to collards because this is what the communities around us knew what to do with the collards and wanted that. So we had to listen much more carefully to what they wanted to get from us. So it wasn't just us generating the ideas, but them. So the, the partnership became really important. So this question about storing produce versus immediate distribution became a big one for us. We realized we didn't want to have to build a whole new infrastructure that allowed for the production and storage of food. Um, we didn't want to have to buy refrigerators. We didn't want to have to do that. So working with our food ministries, we found ways that once we harvested the stuff, we got it to them immediately. So it meant we had to be in touch with them before we started to harvest so we could make the connection. That becomes important unless you're going to go ahead and store the produce. That means refrigeration and things. So that becomes important to consider when you're working with who will receive your produce. Do they have a place to store stuff or are they going to distribute immediately? So we are mindful that we have about five food ministries that we um, partner with and we distribute produce to them. We know which days of the week they are going to be distributing food. Some of them, uh, I think one of the best models we have discovered is some of our food ministries distribute immediately. So we make sure within the 24 hours having harvested the food, they can distribute the food. So it's still good. Some of the food ministries that we work with prepare meals. And when that's the case, we have a little bit more lag time then so that we can get them the food and they, they're going to prepare it so it doesn't have to do 
um, directly with when they're getting distributed to folks. So that preparation piece of it helped all gave us more flexibility. So it worked out really well for us because of the amount that we grow. We had some who were distributing it immediately and some who were preparing. It. So we could get it to them uh, when it was easier for us and they could prepare it. So those become some important questions. Well, what else would you add to this list? When you're thinking about who will receive the produce. So you need to consider who your volunteers are, the worker bees. Will they be church members? Will they be community members or both? Do we, uh, that will be up to your ministry there. What are the ages? If you're going to have children and they're under 16, then you need to make sure there's some safe church training that happens. Um, if they're older adults, and uh, Kendall, I heard you making reference to this, it will influence the type of garden plot you have. Do you need to have raised beds so that older folks can um, better access the gardening? Okay. There's, not, there's so much stooping over. Um, so raised beds versus in the ground planting. Uh, you need to, one of the things we discovered, and we've heard from a lot of folks around here, you have to consider vacation schedules. If church members go away during the summer planting and summer harvesting, you need to plant accordingly. Uh, I have a slide that a little bit later that will talk about this. So particularly, uh, if people tend to vacation in the middle of the summer, you're going to want to plant things that grow in the late spring, greens, and fall when people are back. So what you don't want to do is plant this great, lovely garden, and then in the middle of the summer, people go away for vacation. And now you have a garden that doesn't get harvested. So uh, this is also a lovely thing. One of you commented on the, uh, with the children's garden, where the, uh, partnering with the schools, gardens at the school where, um, that some of your volunteers might be able to, in fact, work in the garden at a time when others are away. So when the kids are not there, you could work in there. You also have to consider, if you're going to have a, a, a church garden, consider what are vacation schedules and who's going to be uh, harvesting. Uh, you're going to want to consider for volunteers who's going to tend the garden regularly, which includes watering the garden regularly, who's going to harvest the produce, and who's going to distribute the produce. So there's lots of different ways to think about it, uh, but those become important. And then have a work plan, both a weekly plan and a seasonal plan, recognizing that some folks uh, can uh, work in the garden after they come home from work. So it's, you know, it's a five o'clock work schedule and some folks can only do weekends um, to kind of partner all those groups up together again. And then seasonally, some folks have a busier schedule uh, certain times, including then vacations. So early spring uh, or late spring, early hard, fall is better for some because of, of those plans. So considering who the volunteers are and what their schedules are becomes important. This is one uh, argument for partnering with a variety of churches or organizations so that you're not just having to figure all this out with one contingent, one cohort of people. So getting a, um, a church that might want to participate with you, getting fraternal and sorority organizations that have some uh, requirements to do service is really important. Lots of high school kids who are headed off to college, in order for them to write their um, applications, need to show that they have service hours. So I wouldn't say you want to rely on these on kids to do that, but they can be a great place to plug in. Um, particularly if you know you're going to have one particular need at harvest time, if you need to have some folks to come in to do that, uh, draw on those fraternal sorority organizations who do that. Um, make connections because they they will be able to provide some volunteers for you as well. Where else have you have you found or know that uh, volunteers or volunteer considerations? What would you add to this list? Our parks department does do seasonal, I believe they call them seed workshops and they connect people who want to work where, where it is needed. 
That's right. how I got involved with the little temple down the road. Mm -hmm. Kendall, that is brilliant. Thank you. Scout groups. Scout groups. Absolutely, scout groups. Mm -hmm. Youth groups. Uh, and in churches, uh, we have had a number of church groups that are going through confirmation who have wanted some place to come and work in the garden. So we've had a number of confirmation groups come through. Christopher, I'm giving you all sorts of ideas for working with those kids. <laughs> you are. Um, we have a preschool that works, that meets five days a week. So I think working with them mm -hmm. to have a plot or whatever would be good. Absolutely. Absolutely. So I'll keep going. So the basics, you need to think about land, sun, soil, and water. So is it going to be on the church property or is it going to be someplace else? And if it's in a communal location, you might need to get some permissions to do that. Um, the land itself, you're going to want to uh, just having access to enough land. I know that the Eden uh, Garden was uh, at one point a driveway. And so we had to build up the, the soil to do that. And um, you can buy soil and you can go up on the Facebook marketplace, keep your eye out for free things because we've connected to a horse farm that composts soil that they had a terrible time getting rid of it. So we regularly get free composted horse manure that we add to the soil uh, that we literally drive over there um, and with a truck and they use their front loader and they just put as much composted horse manure as we want. So to be creative about those kinds of things can be helpful. One of the things that you can do is ask people in your congregations to look out for those things. It, it doesn't have to be you all the time doing it. So put people in your congregation, give them tasks to do. Someone who might be uh, social uh, on social media, but may not have time to do some other things going out into the garden. This is one way they can participate by looking for things on social media, may, uh, Facebook Marketplace, and other places that that are giving out free things. Um, so the tools for gardening as well is another one. We regularly find on Facebook Marketplace these free things where people have planted um, and started inside all sorts of seeds, and now they have way too many, so they're just trying to give them away. So that's another place that you can find some seeds that have already been started. So sunlight and shade, you need to consider that. If you're gonna be growing things, um, you need that the place where you're growing it needs to have at least six hours of sunlight. If it doesn't, if it's mostly shaded, um, you're gonna probably need to consider some uh, either turning trees or go someplace else. So it needs enough sun to be able to grow. Just because it's an empty plot doesn't necessarily mean it's great for planting. You're going to want to have the soil tested if it's not had a garden there before. And at the end of this website, I put uh, a link where you can get um, pretty inexpensive uh, soil test kits to do that. Um, that helps. We've had to regularly kind of boost up our soil, um, both because it was, as I said, dry before. Um, but uh, uh, that's a good thing to always check. And then water access. Um, you're going to want to figure, uh, while you might be able to have um, water collection from rain, it's not likely you'll be able to collect enough to water your garden all the time. So having water access to a water uh, source is going to be important. Um, if there is a, um, a water source, if you're doing this in a church and there's a water source close enough, that's really helpful. If not, you may need to think about how you're going to get that water regular um, application of water to there. And that's important. Um, we have set up a gardening. Uh, so Kendall, you wrote. Uh, I can get you access to a couple tons of compost of manure out in St. Clair, Missouri, off the Merrimack River area. There you go. Perfect. Thank you, Kendall. Uh, start small and scale up. That's always a good thing to think about with gardening. Uh, don't try to start with a huge garden. Pick a couple things to plant um, based on the mission that you're doing, recognizing you can always scale up, but start smaller. So 
start with things that both communities want and that, that, that you're partnering with and add a couple things that your your you might like to add the experiment with. One of the things that we regularly do with our garden is that once we check with the food ministries, what do they want us to grow? We always then add a couple things that we're curious about. Might this grow well in our garden? Might we be able to teach folks what to do with it? Um, that's been quite successful for us. Um, start with crops that quickly mature. So in cool season, that's lettuce and radishes, green onions, kale, spinach, those things. In fact, um, you, you'll begin to see, in fact, we're beginning to grow, start those seeds inside now, those, uh, those things. And in the warm season, bush beans and peppers and tomatoes and zucchini grow very well. Okra, I would also add okra to that list. Okra grows very well in this area. And we grow things that we know are going to do very well in hot and humidity. So okra does very well. Malabar spinach, which is an East Asian spinach, loves hot, humid, loves it, loves it, loves it. And so uh, we grow a ton of that. And that's, um, we've had to teach some of our food ministries how to prepare it. So um, anybody who likes Indian food and has sad paneer, that, that's the kind of spinach that you, you cook with it. But it, it grows like wildfire. Fire. So choose easy to grow flowers. And I think it's fun to grow flowers um, it, it, um, for lots of reasons, including some of them can be pollinators. Um, and I put some examples of flowers that are easy to grow. And then herbs. I heard, uh, Diane, you said you haven't had great success with herbs before. You might try planting those in buckets. They tend to do a little bit better in buckets. Mint, definitely plant mint in buckets because you know that can take over. Um, basil and sage and thyme and parsley, those are a variety. Lavender, I would put on that list as well. Um, can be uh, things, all of those can be pollinators that, that butterflies love. And then consider adding additional pollinator plants like milkweed or coneflower, which milkweed is not the most beautiful, but the butterflies love it. Um, and it will absolutely serve your garden that you can put some milkweed on the edges. What would you add to any of those lists that you might have had some success with? Carrots and turnips. Carrots and turnips. Excellent. Turnips grow like wild in our heat. Okay. Okay. And uh, the baby cherry, the baby okay. cherry tomatoes. Yeah. Yeah. This past year was a very good tomato growing uh, season. The year before, not so much. I should also say, uh, when you choose your land, um, uh, what is the tree that has, sorry, my mind has just gone blind. Sweet gun? Nope, not oh. sweet gun. Uh, walnut trees, black walnut trees. We have a whole bunch of black walnut trees around, and you can't grow any vegetables or, or anything that's in the tomato family, which is almost everything, under black walnut trees. So because of that, we actually have a bunch of raised beds in my home garden because then we can, the soil is not contaminated with a, a, an element called juglon, which is in uh, the black walnuts. Um, so if you've got lots of black walnuts on your property, you may need to offset that by having some containers that you can keep the black walnuts out. It's both in the black walnuts and in the roots, that, so that makes it hard. So I already talked about the, contain, the, the container planting. You saw some of the images earlier on Eden that we have lots of containers around, but those ice buckets, those uh, icing buckets at grocery stores are a great source. It's also a way that we, because we're committed also to teaching gardening techniques. So we'll start a whole bunch of different kinds of seeds and then send people off with the buckets themselves um, to, to, to give it a try. Um, and kid, it makes it, uh, a pretty easy things for kids to take home too then. Okay, tools, equipment, and resources. If you're gonna be growing uh, and uh, taking food produce to folks, who's gonna be transporting that for you? You're gonna need gloves and drinking water and depending on how much you grow, bags for that. And then regularly thinking about soil improvement. Uh, wanted to think about that. I put that note up there about Facebook Marketplace and other social media sites that advertise. Kettle. One thing that surprised me was 
tool safety when we brought in a bunch of people they they didn't use the implements properly or safely um mm -hmm. and we're almost endangering each other with the rakes so so i would definitely keep an eye over that the first time and i brought those brown dollar store gloves for people and everybody was thankful at the end great that was brilliant really so as you think about their budget, you'll want to either, unless you're expecting everyone just to bring their own uh, gloves, drinking water, bags, and all that, you want to consider that, building that into the budget. So then also, you're going to want to tell the story. Um, so both photos and videos. This becomes important for a couple different reasons. One, because you want to be able to tell your story with other people to get them involved. Um, you want people, you want to be able to brag on the work that you do, and that's a way to get people involved. Also, if you're going to want to do any grants, um, you're going to need the statistics for the grants, and you're going to need the photos for the grants. Um, so um, doing that, um, so you want to get how much you produced, what, how many volunteers you work with, and who did you partner with. That, those are kind of the, the three basic things that you're going to want to, to tell the story. Um, I am one that I just like to do the work and not worry about telling the story. And I've had to learn that actually is really important. Um, so uh, if you're a boomer and never think about taking a photograph, then you're going to want to actually have someone who's with you who is, thinks more about photography and using your phone and taking pictures. But because that's helpful. And it's it, it becomes a part of the story. If you're going to have a church, uh, um, a church participated, it becomes part of the church's story. And I think that's really important to tell. What, how do people faithfully live out their, their passions and their faith? Uh, working in the garden is one way. So uh, keeping uh, photos and videos to tell the story becomes important. So this is um, St. Louis, Seed St. Louis is an organization at the end of the uh, website I've given you uh, this ad, how we can get this, um, uh, chart. This is every year they put out a planting chart. So you can see in this it says when just you might start seeds inside, when you can take plant seeds that you started inside and move them outside, and when you can plant them directly into the ground. Um, this is a really helpful resource. You can probably find it other uh, places, but Seed SDL always puts one out. Um, and this is definitely geared toward uh, area six. Uh, zone six that we're in for when to plant and things. But how, keeping this charge around is a really helpful thing. Uh, and in fact, before we leave, it, uh, uh, it's at the end of the um, slideshow here. I'm also going to put it up in Zoom just as an independent chart so you can have it. So here are some other helpful resources. Um, CSTL, which is just the one that you just saw, they have virtual classes that are archived in their website that are free on all sorts of things, how to start seeds, how to transplant seeds, how to plant at different times during the year. They have some low cost virtual classes and they have some face to face classes here in St. Louis. Um, they have uh, they have a way, much like Kendall pointed out, they have a way to connect volunteers to other area community gardens. And I'm going to guess that probably you might check out in your own communities if you're not around St. Louis, but they might do that as well. You can have uh, you can get a membership in the St. Louis, uh, the Seed STL, and they will actually support your community garden with resources and ongoing. They bring they bring in folks to come in and have a conversation with your community. So if you're wanting to have a membership and pay a little bit, that's they are a really good organization. They originally were set up to um, do community gardens in elementary schools. And they've expanded to faith communities. Um, so I highly recommend CSTL. It used to be called Gateway Greening. They changed their name about two years ago. Um, and then I put a couple other resources here. Everything to know about growing vegetables. The University of Illinois Urbana Champaign has a there's a website that will be um, we've linked to that that will give you some really helpful resources, including like how to grow any kind of vegetable you can think of. 
Um, I put some a couple different resources up for children to have gardening with youth things to think about, including I put up a, a kid's video on uh, that's very fun on uh, understanding parts of plants and what they're for. Uh, I put a link there for the Black Church Food Security Network uh, to learn more about that. And then if you want to get soil tests, uh, the Missouri Extension uh, uh, gives information on how to get soil tests. Um, so you might either take a screenshot of this screen if you're trying to quickly jog or take your phone out and take a picture of it, um, which won't help you with the links, but we'll, we'll make access to this uh, um, uh, for you. We can email it out. Oh yeah, we will, uh, we will email this out to you, thank you. And this is, so this is the Eden Garden. At the beginning of the season, every year we plant radishes because we know they come up quickly. Uh, and just to give thanks for another planting season. So this is this was probably taken in mm, mid-May last year, where we just planted, we call them there are amen radishes, um, which is a fun way to say to the community, we're giving thanks again for the work that we do. All right, friends, thanks so much. Be well. Thank you.